All right, my guest today is a forensic historian and independent domestic and foreign policy analyst. His work to that end can be found over at his website, tragedyandhope.com. He has produced and directed many educational film works, including The Ultimate History Lesson, A Weekend with John Taylor Gatto, as well as podcasts, including The Peace Revolution Podcast. He has also created The History Blueprint, which is a tool for autodidactic learning. And he is currently working on a book about the Rothschild family. If all of that wasn't enough, and really even that the stuff I mentioned there is just scratching the surface of what my guest has produced over the last 15 years or so, he is also in the midst of launching a course on life skills and economic self-reliance called Autonomy. I'm so very excited to welcome Mr. Richard Grove. Richard, are you ready to roar? Mark, I roar every day. How you doing? I'm doing great, Richard. It's great to finally speak to you. Uh, I've seen your name pop up now and again uh, over the years. Uh, you know, I was very much a, a conspiracy person before I was a libertarian person. And I know you kind of have weaved in and out of all these circles over the years. Uh, but I wanted to start with one thing that stuck out to me in your bio. And that is the fact that you are also a, a lion of liberty. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but myself and my colleagues who founded Lions of Liberty all went to Penn State. We are all alumni, and that is where the lion in Lions of Liberty comes from. So uh, I, I know you have called your your business degree from Penn State worthless, and that seems like a good place as any to start, considering how much of your work is on the subject of education and cognitive liberty. I, I'm really curious why you feel that that business degree was so worthless, and why are so many people finding that this very expensive piece of paper is often not returning the value that was advertised? first off that was a fantastic bio can i get a copy of that to use because that's <laughs> sure thing. that that's a, that's an arduous process to put all those ideas together it and, took me uh, a while to pick and choose yeah you're books. very eloquent <laughs> succinct cogent uh penn state other two other two other alumni from penn state worth mentioning bill binney and ross Ulbricht. so there's a lot of nittany lions running around out there and none of us had anything to do with lineage. Yeah, and we all stayed clear away from Paterno and that whole sort of thing. So my my schooling there was, yeah, it was a waste of time. <laughs> you went into a lot of debt for that, and uh, it would have led to not such a great life. Fortunately, because I come from a middle-class background, I grew up in western Pennsylvania. My mom was a nurse. My dad was a nuclear power operator. And uh, I went to public school and they didn't have the money to just send me to college and pay for everything and pay for apartment and pay for books and all that stuff. So the deal was I had to pay for things in college like rent and food and things like this. And to do that, I worked and I worked uh, several jobs as a cook and as a sous chef. And I worked a job in a video store and um, one day, and I, I always joke about this because I had no reason to read <laughs> the newspaper in college other than to look for bar specials probably so i always say i was probably looking for you know dollar pictures where is it at tonight or whatever and i saw this ad in there and it said make ten thousand dollars this summer and i said hmm i only make five thousand dollars a summer and i work real hard for that what do i have to do for this ten thousand is it going to be like back breaking labor hanging from bridges doing something dangerous uh, you know, North Atlantic, North, <laughs> North Pacific, uh, crab fishing, what's it going to be? <laughs> so I went to this, uh, this conference hall basically. And there was like a hundred people in there that responded to the ad and we listened to what was going on. And then there was another level and another level. And so I made it through what turned out to be a whole sequence of interviews. And I got this opportunity and I went home and told my parents, Hey, I'm going to be running my own business this summer. I'm going to be making a lot of money. My parents are like, you don't know how to run a business. And, you know, this is a big risk. You know, the, the working at the restaurant, that's a sure thing, that 5000 Didn't you say you have to put in some money to run this business? Well, yeah, it's all, you know, I have to put in 3000 and Here's how I earn it back, right? So they basically convinced me not to take the management job I was offered, but to work as a, a laborer and learn the work. <laughs> and after a couple weeks of that, uh, that was a failing business for the guy who was managing it. I made, uh, he quit. I made his boss an offer to take the job and train myself and do the thing. And that was the most valuable experience that I got during college. So it's like a sub aspect of learning how to pay for college. I got these skills that taught me how to be an entrepreneur, how to run my own business, how to do sales, how to do closing, how to do customer service, all these very, very important skills. So by the time I graduated, all my friends were like going to job fairs and like 
putting their resumes, like they were sweating their resumes, how it was formatted, what format they use, what font, all this stuff. And then they're putting in these huge stacks for these big companies at the job fair and none of them were getting any results. And if they did, it was way below their expectations. And with my skill set, I had friends that were around me who had already graduated working at corporations and they're like, hey, we need salespeople. And oh, by the way, those people got paid to get salespeople. So they're getting referral bonuses to find people. So someone like myself who had the skills, it wasn't long until the opportunities came to me and said, hey, you can be over here. So I ended up started, a, I started a job before I graduated without ever looking for a job, really. I never, I never did a resume or anything. I just went to the interviews. I closed the job and I started. So I was working when they were handing out the graduation. So I didn't go, I didn't, the degrees. So I didn't go to graduation. Though I graduated, I have a diploma, I have a transcript, I have the bills for it. But so I was already, you know, I was already starting to live my dream by the time that other people were like, well, I got to get a job now. Well, other- it sounds like a lot of the skills that you were acquiring in college or, or what turned out to be the most valuable skills were not really what you were learning in the classroom, per se. It was more the side effects of, like you said, learning to manage your own money, uh, learning to manage a business, uh, learning sales. But all of that for you took place, it sounds like, completely outside of the classroom, which I guess speaks to the uh, what you would call the worthlessness of your degree. Absolutely. And learning how to interview and hire the right people how to retain those people and keep them happy and make sure they're reaching their goals and doing what they want and getting something out of it. And these skills are paramount in success and entrepreneurism and everything to do with Liberty, right? Cause they all deal with communication and working with people and getting goals and accomplishments and these sort of things. That's not what my schooling was about. And ironically, I was getting a business management degree at that point because I went in for engineering or maybe be a doctor. And then it's like I ended up transitioning into business management. And by the time I was actually like taking those classes, I had been running my own business. I knew how to do it in reality. And I learned that even if I had like been paying more attention in class and not working so much, that it wasn't relevant information. It wasn't the things that I was actually applying to go up to a door, knock on it, ask them about their house. Right. In this case, they were teaching us the business of house painting because that was a good thing to teach college students back then. You go home and work on spring break. You line up your deals for the summer. You hire your crew. You train your crew. You complete the jobs. You bank a bunch of money. You get executive management experience. And what I found also from working at these big corporations was the training from the entrepreneurs that I got in uh, in college far surpassed what I got at these other big corporations in the real world. The sales training I got, the the communications training, the human resources, like how to hire somebody, how to fire somebody, all those types of things were much more personable than I ever got from one of these big, uh, you know, multinational corporations. So <clears throat> the the example I would use is this January of my senior year, there's Super Bowl. This will tell you how, how old I am. Uh, it was Green Bay Packers and Brett Favre won MVP. And they gave him a Porsche Boxster. Now, I'm at the end of my college, like, I'm, I'm going to get this degree. And I don't have any prospects for that degree. But I hadn't really realized I gained this whole other skill set by running a company, right? And, and doing successfully for several years. And then selling that to my brother, who was four years younger than me. And he did the same thing. So I, I see this ad, like the, the promo at the end where they give him the car. And I think, gee, it's $50,000. I'll never be able to afford a car like that. Now, less than 18 months later, I had that car. Not without even trying to like go get that car. It's just I was successful enough to at one point where I was like, hey, I could get that car. Right. And so I never could have gotten that car with my Penn State degree. <laughs> and, um, you know, the skills that I, I learned. And so I had to go off the beaten path. Anybody can get a job at a restaurant. Anybody can get a job at a video store. Not anybody can look for opportunity and figure out. And and I had a second chance at it, too, because I blew it the first time. Right. And same thing happened when I was done. and I was graduating school. I thought maybe I should continue running my own business. My parents are like, no, you should get a real job. So you have insurance. Right. 
They're still so, stuck on that real job, aren't they? <laughs> hey, <laughs> my and parents that, still think I need a real job too. So, and and then it wasn't too long, a uh, couple years after working in the corporate world, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, that I found myself saying, you know what, I really do need to work for myself. And it does like the most important thing right now is not healthcare; it's doing the right thing and the highest and best use of my time. So I had to make some real life choices, and those skills availed me the freedom in my mind to say, I'm going to do the right thing because I don't have a mentality of scarcity. I know I can go apply my skills any number of ways and be successful. Most of the other people who, who kept their, their mouth shut when these things were going on, that was their only thing. They had that, they needed that job. If they lost it, they don't know how to get another job. They certainly don't know how to work for themselves. They certainly don't know how to overcome all the mental challenges it takes to be autonomous and to walk your own path. So they stay on the path and they take the money, they keep their mouths shut, and that's why there's corruption in the world. That is a really uh, interesting summary of, I guess, not only why there's corruption, but I guess why so many people will remain silent uh, in the face of seeing that corruption or the face of seeing something that they know is wrong. And, and you became a corporate whistleblower, I, I believe, around 2004, uh, as you sort of referenced there. And, and it's really interesting that you tie that into the fact that you knew you had these other skills. You knew you'd be able to survive without that corporate job, whereas perhaps your colleagues around you, many of which might have been seeing the same things, might have even thought they were wrong, but they were so afraid because they didn't have those other skills or didn't feel they had the ability to survive without kind of latching onto that job as a security blanket. Well, it's like the meta skill set. So <clears throat> working at, so let me just describe some of my jobs, right? Uh, large software companies, like tens of thousands of people in some cases, down to 30 people in the smallest case, right? Uh, they're all doing business with huge multinational banks, defense contractors, insurance companies, uh, these sorts of things. So the people that I was working among, they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. They have a skill set that they can close deals. You know what they can't do? They can't run a company. They can't figure out all these other things they would need to do to be autonomous. So they have to wait in their position in this company and wait for leads to come. And then they can transact on those because that's all they know how to do. For myself, I had the soup to nuts broad spectrum with a whole bunch of specialties in that general spectrum. If people lack the general spectrum, then they're locked into thinking, well, I do need a, a another job in this area. And the only way I can get that is through what they call uh, the, the colloquial term is a headhunter. There's headhunters. There's uh, They're like consultants that companies hire to go find salespeople or people with those types of skill sets. Right. right? High value skill sets. And then those people call you while you have a good job and they offer you a better job. And that's how the industry works. <laughs> So I'm still waiting for that call myself. <laughs> yeah, right. So <clears throat> the reason that people do those things, right, there's evil out there. And a lot of that evil is because people are ignorant or nescient. And then some of those people are just downright nefarious. But they are all, like they're all participating in the same thing at different levels. So for me, once I got to a level where people were being adversely affected on a mass scale, like millions and millions of people were being adversely affected by what I saw and that the people I was telling and that were supposed to be responsible totally were not. And they were take, you know, they were making money from the whole deception. Uh, I was like, this isn't the, the highest and best use of my time. And I learned a few lessons about how the, the justice system works and how the, the media and the news works and, and all these sort of things. And, um, <clears throat> that, um, that audio track that you said you were up listening to last night, at the end of that, if you listen to it, I'm basically saying, okay, so there's a whole bunch of stuff going on and somebody needs to do something about this. And here's a couple, you know, maybe the guys from Loose Change will do something about it, right? But after a year or so, I was like, oh, I shouldn't expect other people to take these actions. I see that these things need to be done. I see that this research or this clarification or this presentation needs to be made. So I took it upon myself and started using that as my highest and best use of my time because without freedom and liberty in this country, there's no entrepreneurism, there's no private property, there's no self-ownership, there's no time for any of these philosophies because we'll all be breaking rocks or doing some sort of labor in a camp someplace. I mean, it's not a very nice picture that erupts when, when freedom and liberty and free, especially freedom of thought and with the attacks on freedom of speech, that's right next to the freedom of thought, right? Um, break out. I mean, anybody who has doubts, just read the Gulag Archipelago. 
Read all three volumes, though, so you know how to get out of that. But that's the desired structure, like panopticonic structure with technocracy that they're trying to build. And the only way that I could figure out of that was, <clears throat> like, figure out who was doing this. Do they have a plan? Do they have funding? What state of the plan are they in? Are they experiencing resistance? Who has resisted in the past? You gather up all that information. You figure out how they're maintaining control. And then you figure out how to break that control and, you know, backfill the self-reliance, self-confidence, self-esteem that people need to be autonomous and resist despotism and tyranny. So for me, the past 15 years has been working to answer one big problem, and it's how do we preserve freedom and liberty into the future. And to solve that problem or answer that question, like how do we do that, uh, it took a lot, of, a lot of time and research and production and assembly and... Um, but now we're at a point where I think everybody, like we have the technology, people have the aptitude. They're now inclined to start looking at these problems and trying to solve it because they can now see with all these autonomous drones and robots and all the things that they're creating, plus the surveillance grid, freedom can be extinguished very quickly if, uh, if things, you know, if we don't take action to preserve it and safeguard it. And if we don't, in, invent solutions faster than they can invent ways to capture our imagination, right? So everyone's getting deplatformed right now. That's a thing. Well, how do we get to be over here now? Is IPFS an answer where you can just put it out there and we can all seed each other and we don't need them as an infrastructure in between us. But it's a tough time out there for Liberty. I know some people were discouraged because they see all these things going on, but I'm always encouraged because there's always people out there trying to solve these problems to move us forward, to progress us in the light direction and not, you know, freedom, freedom lives in the light. Liberty lives in the light. Washington Post says democracy dies in darkness. I think they're pessimists. I think they want it to be dark. I think censorship of information is a purposeful darkening of you can't see here. And if you, ha you can't see there, why? Because if we saw that, we might do something different. If we saw the truth, we wouldn't be so malleable and submissive and just apathetic to the whole thing, right? You so know, we're in the I midst of an live, interesting uh, time. I, I used to live a lot more in what you refer to as the darkness when I, when I guess I first started to see a lot of these problems in the world and I first started to understand more about, uh, I guess, some of the more corrupt structures in our society and uh, the oppressive structures, if you will, all the sorts of things that you talk about. And I think more so when I started this podcast, um, I think doing this has in many ways encouraged me because every single day, just by sitting here with my microphone and my laptop, I'm finding new and new people that are actually interested in hearing these ideas, people that reach out to me and say, wow, this is so cool. I found your podcast and I never heard about this stuff before. I never knew what libertarianism was. I never knew about some of these ideas. And just even if, even if I did this and only affected one total human being the whole time, it would probably honestly be worth it to me. But I know that there are many more than one. Uh, there are, there are just endless amounts of people that I think out there that, I, that we haven't even found yet that can sense, like you've mentioned, something that's wrong in the world. They can sense sort of a, a, a vacuum of knowledge and they're ready for it to be filled. So that's why I'm glad there's so many voices like yourself out there uh, ready to fill that gap. Well, and you, you remove the obstacles for people and you provide a platform to bring that together. A lot of people experience the first part of what you were just observing, but they don't go through the trouble to be like, wait a minute, I could do that too. Like, Mark, tell the audience, do you have any superpowers? Superpowers? Super I don't believe I do. Um, I, I'd like to think maybe I have some latent superpowers, some mutant gene <laughs> that it hasn't, it hasn't really come out yet. But as far as I know, I have the same exact powers, so to speak, as any other human being. And My if you voice, did have a superpower, it's that you've trained your willpower to do constructive, productive things that provide value for other people, right? Sure, I could just sit up late at night and uh, you know drink some beers and watch conspiracy documentaries and get mad and upset, and that used to be what I did. But at some point, I decided to become more productive and uh, try to find some ways to at least address some of the problems that I see in the world, which I think ultimately very much so come down to philosophy more than necessarily a specific issue here or a specific you know societal structure here and there. All of it comes down to the, the philosophy that the individuals of the world believe and how that sort of collectively manifests. So that's, that's where I've sort of focused things over the years. Yeah, I like to look at things through a lens of liberty 
And that means kind of looking at it in terms of freedom and slavery. So if people just looked at it at anything in terms of freedom or of slavery, or <clears throat> let's even break it down even simpler, thou shall not steal theft, right? So slavery would be theft of your freedom and all of our fears. I haven't found any on my list or anyone else's list that I've talked to are all the fears are based around a loss of freedom or liberty. You have a fear of spiders or snakes. Why? Because they could bite you, kill you. It takes away your freedom and liberty, right? So if we just break down these fears and learn to identify those things, then we can learn to overcome, step over, go around those things and make progress. But as long as we continue to like shriek and be like, ah, that's, that's what we're indoctrinated to do through the school system. So in, in some ways, what you're doing is very remarkable because it's antithetical to 15,000 hours of communications studies in, in, uh, in public schooling where they're telling you, this is how it is. This is how you should think. You're part of a group. You've been designated as this. This is your path in life, right? And I'm pretty sure that, uh, well, let me ask you, was there a class in school where you learned to do what you're doing today? Well, in fairness, podcasting didn't exist, but but uh, back then. But uh, the answer is no, in the sense of there was never even a mention. I don't think that I can really think of of even the idea of doing your own thing, uh, not even just starting your own business, but even just doing your own project. Uh, the only thing that I ever learned, and I was you know taught entirely by public school prior to going to Penn State, and uh, was really here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to learn to take these tests. You're supposed to learn to repeat this information back. And I was very good at that part of it. Uh, you're then supposed to go into debt and go to college and get a degree. We both did that part of it. Uh, and then you're supposed to go get a corporate job, work 40 hours a week, and go into more debt to buy a house, and then spend the next 30 to 40 years paying that debt off. Go vote every once in a while so you feel better about the system that you're participating in and uh, eventually die taking your Social Security check. That's, that's basically what I was taught in public school. Yeah. And I would have been on that same path had I not built a high value skill set. And I, you know, that allowed me to work in the corporate world, but it also allowed me to step out of there and continue to have a fruitful, productive, happy life, <laughs> you know? And I, that's the part that most people are missing. That's the part that gives you the real freedom. And you don't have to worry about like losing your job to outsourcing or downsizing or changes in policies, or they didn't like the tweet you sent yesterday. So now you're fired. That's the type of world we live in today. Right. So there's literally, now, my thinking was in school that if you were taught anything about what you're doing today, it would have been like AV club and you would have had experience with analog equipment. We didn't have that in my school, but <laughs> they had it in my school, but that I didn't, I didn't appreciate the opportunity. I didn't understand that. Oh, you, that's a whole path. I had friends at Penn state that were in uh, filmmaking school there. I was like, what, sh what do you, you know, they, I went to high school and then we see each other cause you go to a branch campus. Some of the people uh, for a couple of years, I went to yeah. university park for five years. So when they got there and they're in film school, I'm like, what do you guys do? They're like, we watch films all day. I'm like, I'm taking calculus and all sorts of crazy courses over here, like fluid I started flow, off in mechanics. that very same film program, and that is literally what you did. You watched movies and you talked about them. And at some point, I just realized that, that you know, I, I needed more out of life than just, I can watch movies on my own and talk about them with my friends on my own. Didn't really need to pay for this degree to do that. Of course, I later figured out I didn't really need the degree at all. Like you said, I mean, I did learn a few remedial television production skills in college, but what I always thought when my biggest takeaway from college was the friends that I made, the connections that I made, uh, those are bearing fruit today in, in the forms of this, this podcast, uh, and as well as just the, the life skills and the social skills. And as far as the actual TV skills I learned, well, geez, I really could have just volunteered at the local TV station, lived in state college and done the exact same thing without spending the money. Right. Right. And then, um, so then I'm in the entrepreneur world. I'm trying to figure out, like I figured out podcasting. That was pretty easy. Then I started teaching myself, uh, cinematography and film production. So I went to like the cable access place, uh, locally cause they would teach you how to do it and they would loan you equipment. They let me use their equipment like twice. And they're like, uh, we don't like your content. We don't like what you're trying to do. So <laughs> you're then talking about some weird stuff here, man. I was just talking about freedom, liberty, and, you know, that's weird to them. So I started to learn how to, I got my own tripod, my own camera, I got my own lights. And then I learned over time. I learned because I saw people doing things. Then I asked the question, oh, how do they do that? And I would either ask them or look it up online or buy a book about it. And then I'd move to the next step. And so most of my useful learning has gone on in spite of school or after I retired from corporate work. I put myself in an immersive situation where I surrounded myself with a whole bunch of information and parsed through it and organized it. 
and marshaled it to create content to point it out to other people. And all those skills are, again, they're like in spite of having been indoctrinated for those 15,000 hours. So if I had had that time from schooling early in life for self-directed learning, and I had a curriculum that actually taught me how to get to success, how to attain, maintain, and retain freedom, that would have been really useful. But I don't think that exists yet, right? And I see a lot of people struggling with the same problems, those same problems that you just described. You get the degree, you get the job, and that's kind of like the rest of your life. And you have weekends and a couple weeks a year of vacation, and you're always in a mentality of scarcity because you're locked into your income. The bills are ever increasing. Like the gas prices go up, the food prices go up, all these things go up. Your salary doesn't necessarily go up. Sometimes you get salary cuts or you get downsized or you get furloughed, laid off, all these different things. Entrepreneurism, in my experience, has always given me uh, a greater amount of that illusion called control, which has seemed very satisfying. <laughs> you know, like if I don't want to do a meeting on a Monday, I just schedule my meetings for Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, and I get work done in my office on Monday. I don't why, have why to. Do you, I don't have to wait to be told to do anything. I can just I'm do. Curious why, why you refer to it as an illusion of control? Mm. Well, I think especially there, when you're referring to sort of having control over your own life, do you even see that as an illusion? Well, I think it? I no no. I I believe that we have the the choice of free will, and that includes like uh, to use words to think or not to think. So there are limitations to reality that we can't control. There's cause and effect and certain things that we can't go around that we are subservient to. So we can manage the things that we can manage, like basic stoicism 101. Uh, don't worry about the things you can't control and the things you can control. Just work on those things. Don't worry about them. Just take a uh, plan of action and next steps. So I think that we're brought up in a world, though, that doesn't want you to know about free will or your choice, because, again, choice leads to thinking and thinking makes you hard to control. But we're brought up with this idea of nature versus nurture and nowhere in there is the idea of free will or that despite your situation, uh, you can change yourself. And that's called learning. It's not a conspiracy. And, you know, it's been going on for a long time. But the secrets of how to do it efficiently, effectively for yourself are well hidden because um, that's, that's how they prefer it. That's how they keep control. That's how they make defending liberty a thing. Otherwise, we'd just all be enjoying it. Nobody would try to be, you know, uh, master over us. Richard, I want to tick back a little bit and, and dive more into, um, and we can dive even more. I know you're going to stick around for a bonus segment, so maybe we can get even to, into more of the nitty or gritty, nitty and gritty stuff mm. in there. But uh, can you just be a little more specific about uh, when you became a corporate whistleblower and what exactly that you saw? What were you blowing the whistle on at the time? The history behind it is that uh, around 2001, actually around the time of 9-11, the week before, Enron crashed. So everyone kind of forgot about that because 9-11 happened. So Enron crashes. Tyco International was another large multinational conglomerate with a huge accounting scandal. As a result of that, Congress in 2002 created a law called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and that made sure that companies had to preserve their email and their basically the data and audit trails of how they do business. So as an example, in those accounting scandals, those guys in their emails planned how to carry out those schemes. And then they deleted those emails. So when they find that these guys committed fraud, it's hard to get the evidence. So the government was like, we need a better plan. So the plan they put in place was to make sure that any publicly traded co corporation had to have a certain type of software that would archive and audit and in such a way that it can't be destroyed uh, relevant uh, information and, and data channels relating to commerce. There is also a government law that applies to federal. So when email goes missing for Bush or Clinton or any of these people, somebody should be pointing out, hey, there's a law that says that they have to be doing this. And if she's using her private server, that's definitely outside the law. But we won't get into like politics of it. Sarbanes-Oxley applied across all these different companies. So I had a friend working at a company <clears throat> that I knew about because I had other friends that had worked there over the years. 
And he said, I said, Hey, what are you, what are you doing these days? He said, I'm selling this software. It's federally mandated. Everybody has to buy it. Sounds like a great sales job to have, I guess. huh? He said, what are you doing? And I said, Oh, I said, uh, I just left this other corporation. It was a startup and, uh, I'm not doing anything right now. I'm just chilling, relaxing. He's like, do you want to work? And I was like, sure. Uh, you know, who do I talk to? So then I talked to his boss. His boss called me for a meeting. I had a meeting. They made me an offer. I took a job. And, and the job was so, I don't know, man. This was a company. Do you ever see Goodfellas? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So where they get that guy, the, the guy wants the, uh, Polly to buy into the restaurant. And then they burn it down after they run up the credit. Uh-huh. This company, Legato, was like that restaurant. So I get there and they're like shutting down the office down on Wall like it wasn't Wall Street. I think it was Maiden Lane, which is right across from AIG, financial district in New York City. So for the first week or two, I had an office downtown, but then they just closed the office. And they're like, everybody work from home. Uh, I didn't get a laptop. I didn't get an email address from the company until after the merger. So they were like about to go into this merger with EMC Corporation, and that was July of 2004, 2003, 2003. And um, so I started working at this company and I start meeting with clients. And so I, I think I started in May. I trained in June. So early July, I'm meeting with Tyco International, which has been the scandal's been in the news and they need our software. So I'm having a meeting with the chief general counsel, the top lawyer in the company who definitely knows about the fraud that they just did. Right. So I'm pitching her. I'm like, look, <clears throat> you guys got to keep all this data. It's FBI, SEC mandate. You're keeping them on Microsoft Exchange servers. That's very expensive storage space. You can use our email extender and it's going to be, you know, write once, read many, worm drive meets the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley requirements. And I explained to her the solution. They have a problem. Here's a solution. Boom, right? <clears throat> and she says to me, I don't want to preserve this data. I want to know how to delete it and make sure make it look like it was never there. And I was like, uh, "What did I just mishear you?" And my the the technical rep from my company who had been working there longer, he says to their tech person a couple things. He's like, "We could talk about how we do that after the meeting. That's not really part of the presentation." And I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." That's interesting. At the same week, I was being asked to uh, falsify my sales forecasts. And there was a merger coming up. So my concern was, hmm, you guys want me to like quadruple my forecast and then you're going to float that up to these guys cutting the merger. And the merger hadn't gone through a couple months earlier, so they had doubled the price. So now these guys that are buying are paying double the price and these guys are trying to use me and my team to our spreadsheets to justify, hey, we got all this money in the pipeline. So I wrote emails about that. So this escalated over months. So the next month I met with the National Association of Securities Dealers. They're supposed to be a watchdog on the stock market. They tell me in the meeting that they found a back door in the software that I'm selling as a prophylactic. So they're like, hey, there's a hole in the prophylactic. And I have management in the meeting and I turn around like, what's the deal with this, right? So I talk to them about that. They're like, it's above your pay grade. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. I'm like, well, it's a problem with this customer. He's like, well, then they're not our target customer. Oh, you mean the NASD is honest and they don't want to cheat and they actually didn't want to uh, breach the integrity of their data with this back door? You mean these guys are smart? And So anyway, <clears throat> I went through the process of blowing the whistle under Sarbanes-Oxley. So there's a whistleblower provision. I was selling the software to clients. Now, Sarbanes-Oxley provision applies to a whole bunch of other people. But I had enough knowledge about it because I sold the software and educated clients on the whistleblower provisions. So ironically enough, I found myself having to use those. And when you do that, like what I thought was, I'm going to blow the whistle to the people buying this company because they're being taken advantage of. They're being ripped off. When in reality, that's why they were buying Legato. That's why EMC purchased Legato Systems because of that. So the guy that I wrote to deeper than you realized. Yeah. So the guy I wrote to in EMC, who was the top uh, attorney in EMC, I proved in court that he's the guy the same day I blew the whistle to him who ordered my termination, which according to Sarbanes-Oxley whistleblower provisions is a prisonable offense. 
But those things don't matter in reality. They're just on paper. They don't enforce those things. Now you could say, well, is EMC a powerful corporation? And I would say they were Dick Cheney's largest fundraiser. And this founder of EMC was a billionaire who was ambassador to Ireland appointed by Bush. So it was the wrong time to blow the whistle on those people doing those things because it was convenient politically to scuttle the whistleblower and make sure nobody gets warned about that because that would be... Oh, and so if you've got this software that's mandated to put the back door, then you can have a big fraud that goes on and nobody can trace it because these are, all these emails are deleted. Cue the financial crisis in 2008 where all those subprime loans were, were managed and packaged up and AAA rating. Where's all the emails that proves all that fraud to put those people in prison who stole all that money, all that retirement money from all these people in America? Oh, don't worry about that. There's no data to be found. Nobody's going to go to jail for that. Everybody just lost their shirt and nobody rioted. So, you know, they'll keep doing it. It is pretty it. incredible that, that, you know, one of, if not the most massive uh, instance of well-known and very publicly acknowledged fraud uh, in our modern times with the financial crisis and the, and the real estate crisis, uh, not a single human being is facing prison time. It's really shocking, especially considering we live in a country where mm, luckily it's changing a bit, but we still live in a country where a small amount of a plant can send you to jail for a long time. Mm. And uh, the fact that th that still uh, exists for certain par parts of our population, whereas uh, this rampant, well-known corporate, very public fraud is just completely untouched. Uh, it, it says a lot about the systems that we live in. And it's that type of system that we live in and the people of that mentality that allow someone like Ross Ulbricht to sit in prison for five years as a nonviolent offender with an egregious sentence. And it's like people like <clears throat> I'm not sure if you went through the, the case history railroaded that they just offered a couple months ago. But if you just listen to the first three parts of that, you will see how Kafka esque our country has gotten because it's not about Ross's case. All the precedents being set are dangerous for everybody dangerous pre precedents for freedom uh, of surveillance of uh, use of third party action being held you, like they call it vicarious liability it's where you can be held guilty for somebody else's actions like it doesn't even make sense they're responsible for their actions right so there's all these dangerous precedents that are being set in that case and <laughs> you know we live in a country where it's okay. it's just okay we have political prisoners here you know it's okay. It's, Richard, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're a free country, though. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Richard, something else I want to dig into to with you a little bit is uh, your website is called Tragedy and Hope. Um, I, I'm sure a portion of my listenership at least has heard of the book Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley, uh, the namesake of which you named uh, basically all of your branding after. So I, I'm kind of curious when you first encountered that book and, and why do you feel it's so significant? I first encountered it in 2004 and I first um, appreciated its contents more. Uh, so I, I found out about it in 2004. I got a first edition copy in 2004. It cost me $300 because at the time the book was basically uh, – they destroyed the printing plates so it could never be copied again. So there was only a couple first editions out there from the first printing and then there was a bootleg version of the book that was out there. So I made sure I got the first edition real deal copy in there. Uh, so the, the book is called tragedy and hope, a history of the world in our time. It's written in 1966 by a Georgetown professor of, uh, the school of foreign service. His name is Carol Quigley. And he was a graduate of Princeton and Harvard and had done a bunch of highfalutin East coast intellectual work for the government, defense contractors, uh, and Georgetown, that's uh, some place where they're training people for diplomatic service. So they're training spies, basically. So he gets in contact with this whistleblower um, in the 1940s. And this whistleblower says that he was part of a secret society, but that he's no longer part of it. And he goes through the details and tells him all about the secret society. So Carol Quigley in 1948 writes a book called The Anglo-American Establishment. Now, 1948, that's a long time ago. He didn't print it. It wasn't printed until 1981 after he, after he died. 
because he felt that if he released that book during his lifetime, his life would be in danger and it would definitely crush his career. So while Tragedy and Hope in 1966 has aspects of this story, the bigger story is in the smaller book from 1981, which was written in 1948, the Anglo-American establishment. That's the condensed version from the whistleblower perspective. Now, I've gone and checked, and these are all real people. These are all real things. These documents are all verifiable. It's a very, very solid depiction. And the reason he wrote that is because uh, they wanted a book, the people he worked with, his colleagues, wanted a book that could actually show the actual history and not the, pre not the propagandized history of the Western world. And so it covers... Um, like the early uh, 20th century up till uh, 1950, I think, even though it's written in 66. So what they did was, as soon as he releases this book in 1966, Tragedy and Hope, they recognize that he's given too much information in this book to the public. So they destroy the printing plates. Macmillan Publishing destroys the printing plates and lies to Quigley about it. They tell him they didn't. They say there's just no demand for the book. Then they take the second half of the book and they publish it under another title called The World Since 1939, A History by Carol Quigley. It is a verbatim second half of Tragedy and Hope, the book. Why don't they want us to have the first half? What's in the first half of the book? That's why I wanted to get the first edition so I could read the whole thing and not just something I had read on the Internet. I wanted to see this is an artifact of history. Let me see what it has to say. So the story in there is very dry, very boring, very verbose to hide slim little selections of truth where he discloses how our government in the United States is running, has run for a long time, who controls in a supranational manner our banking systems, our political systems, uh, and how they fund both sides. They'll fund the communists and the capitalists. And he explains this all in his book. He tells you who's involved. So when I first encountered what I encountered in the world as far as uh, a higher level of corruption and things that weren't on my map of the world as uh, given to me by Penn State and uh, Beaver Area High School in Pennsylvania, right? Like my map did not have these pitfalls on it. So who like is there is there a, a more to the world than just uh, President Bush? Is there somebody higher? Is there something going on? So in trying to answer these questions, there is unfortunately a lot, a lot, a lot of substance to what Quigley was pointing out. And then I found other scholars like Anthony, uh, Professor Anthony Sutton, who used to work for the Hoover Institute, Stanford University. And the reason he got fired is because uh, well, he wrote a bunch of books, but he found out that the people he was writing about were the people he worked for. And when... <laughs> So he says, hey, Trilateral Commission, this is a nefarious group, and there, there's all these people. Well, David Packard of Hewlett Packard was in Trilateral, and he was Anthony Sutton's boss at the Hoover Institute. And then they're like, you can't be, you're not writing for us this, these topics. Like, we are defending the status quo, and you're trying to tear it down. Sutton's books show that Wall Street uh, funded the Bolshevik Revolution, funded the Nazis, and then fought against those two groups, right? So there's this undercurrent in history of proxy forces and, and divide and conquer and funding enemies, uh, you know, conveniently, these sort of things. So to answer your question and bring it full circle, I started to realize about the value of the, the information in the book, Tragedy and Hope. I bought the URL in 2004. Over the next five years, I deepened and verified uh, that, that base of knowledge. And then in 2009, I launched it uh, with my wife along, as an online magazine. So it was a flip page type online magazine that had embedded audio and video and articles and like really cool graphics. And it was awesome. And people loved it. And it took us six months to make a one issue. And then they wanted more like the next day. So we immediately converted it to an online learning community that runs 24 seven. And now, uh, I've been doing that. That's 10 years now. Jeez. Since 2009 to 2019. So uh, this must be our 10th anniversary this year. I guess I can say that now. Right. Right. Good timing. <laughs> As of July 4th. I think we launched it on July 4th. So I think I have to wait till July to say that accurately. 
Very cool. I mean, it, it almost comes right back full circle to what you're talking about, about, about that fear of, you know, how so many people don't uh, call out what they see because of fear of losing the job. Even in that case, uh, he was afraid to speak out against the trilateral commission because, you know, it was, it was a safety for him. Even at these higher levels of things, there's that same fear that we might have on, on these lower rungs, so to speak. Yeah. And he talked about it, like as an author, it was much easier to work for Hoover Institute because you're getting paid, you get funded for your projects, doors open up for you when you would call places, but then on his own, it was a lot more arduous, faced a lot more resistance, called many names, many disparaging names. And yet he is one of the brilliant minds of the 20th century that was pointing toward a really big problem that affects adver adversely affects like 8 billion people. And the population grows into the future. So if we don't take care of this problem, it just continues to plague more and more people. And it, I never expect like evil and tyranny and these things to go away fully or completely. But what we can do as in, individuals, improve our intellect, sharpen that intellect, gain more self-reliance and more autonomy, and we can keep it in check. We don't have to tolerate it. But right now it's tolerated because large groups of people can't even recognize it. So if you stand up and try to say something against it, it's like you get attacked by a bunch of NPCs. And I say the only solution to the problem, because NPCs continue to spawn, is to come up with some sort of meme. I call it freedom. I didn't originate it. I just see it for what it is. And you spread freedom, and the, the meme spreads, and then people learn to appreciate the opportunity to, uh, uh, to achieve some autonomy in their lives. Because freedom has the response, like freedom has benefits, but it also has responsibilities. And until we embody these responsibilities, we don't really get the benefits. So we've withered in our society from a, from a society that was self-reliant, had self-esteem, had self-confidence without going to Walmart or Target. And now it's withered. We still think we're free, but we don't have the responsibilities and we don't have the benefits. We just have the label. So I could see that and be like, oh, that sucks. Let's go watch Netflix or play Fortnite. Or we could be like, oh, let's just reverse that trend. Yeah, I see how that's going on. Let's, let's try this. And if this doesn't work, let's try this. Right. And you keep trying and you persist despite the resistance. And I think that's that's the spark of liberty that needs to uh, be preserved and kindled into a, a burning fire of freedom. In my mind. And that really is, uh, Richard, what so much of your work focuses on is not just exposing the problems in our society and these corrupt structures, but teaching people how to think for themselves and become more autonomous. That is, of course, why you named your course Autonomy. So before I let you go here on the main show, why don't we uh, why don't you just run through exactly what your course is, let people know. I believe you're in sort of a beta launch uh, version right now. So let people know what's going on with that and how they could possibly benefit from it. Well, the way you benefit from it is you apply your skills of learning to a specific focus to gain clarity, to gain proficiency, to gain a little experience, and then you can go out and use that in the world for the rest of your life. So what I'm trying to do is uh, I've noticed a problem over the years. I mean, the, the symptoms can look like learned helplessness, uh, this whole fear-based, scarcity-based mentality. Um, there's a lot of symptoms to it, but the real problem is people are expected to survive and thrive and they haven't been given the tools. They haven't been given a, a like a fear-free training area where they can refine the skills and, and develop them into something that they can rely on. And there's a whole bunch of aspects of success that aren't taught in school. They're not made available in the normal everyday employee workplace but are things that I've found uh, throughout my career and my experience and my success that are transferable to other people. And that's the part where I took issues like, you know, people not having enough money to pay the bills. And to me, I, that's a direct symptom from the school system. And the root cause is they have an absence of uh, skills, experience, knowledge, confidence, ability to speak clearly, cogently, to express their needs and get them met. And so I created a course, uh, a curriculum, and this has started like in 2007. So it's been a long time to create it. But what it is trained to do, what it is expected to do, what it is tested and currently being used to do is take people who are anywhere on the spectrum. So there's people in there who are very successful. There's physicians and attorneys and accountants and those types of people. There's people who have never had a job. 
And there's people who are at less than zero. They've had many failures. They really need something to work out. And I put together a set of components that people can go through of their own free will and volition and they can consume the knowledge. And I've created a, a, a work and exercise space online that they can come in and practice these ideas together with other students and other teachers that are in the course. And uh, also ways that you can practically apply the skills to bring in income or to achieve your goals in life. So there's like knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and the, the slogan for the course would be discover, understand, and excel. So you learn some things about yourself and about the world. You come to understand and practice those and gain proficiency. And then you're able to excel by applying those skills in a real world context. And then what separates it from other courses are uh, <clears throat> most other courses are just there to give you information. and Good luck being successful. What I did was I wanted a course that creates successful people and reverse engineered from there. So part of the success is customer support. Part of the success is interaction with other students. Part of the success is the integrity and comprehensive nature of the knowledge. Part of the success are the team leaders who help you refine your skills within these work groups and work areas of the course. So it's very comprehensive. It's meant to be a replacement for all types of schooling. There's uh, people in there from 18 all the way into their 80s. As you mentioned, I'm doing the beta enrollment right now to work out the, uh, to fine tune some of those technical aspects of broadcasting a live lecture and having audio and video and all these things work at the same time. But um, there's almost 200 people in the beta class, and I'm looking to make it open to the public uh, later this spring. All right, well, Richard Grove, uh, I do really appreciate you coming on the show and talking about these issues today and uh, your work to help people achieve uh, greater cognitive liberty, greater freedom in their lives. Uh, like I said several times, we've only really scratched the very, very bare surface of your work. So, you know, we'll dig in a little bit more on the Patreon show, which we're going to do in a few minutes here. Uh, but until then, why don't you just let everybody know one more time, of course, like I mentioned, tragedyandhope.com is really where they can find uh, all your work, but feel free to let them know how they can find the course and anything else that you'd like to plug before we uh, move on here tragedyandhope.com is my website but it's the last thing i update i do update my patreon so it's patreon forward slash tragedy and hope that's updated regularly and uh, my podcast is the peace revolution podcast and you can find it at peacerevolution.org richard grove thank you so much for joining me today it's been a great time. I really wish you the best of luck with everything you're doing. So keep up the great work. Keep on roaring. We'll talk to you a bit more on the bonus show. Thank you so much for the invite.